moving on to uh, Kate, Kate Locke, Marine Conservation Officer with um, Natural Resources Wales. And she is um, spent 25 years working for Natural Resources Wales at the Stoma Marine Conservation Zone, where annually she conducts the Grey Seal surveys alongside long-term diving and seashore monitoring projects. Kate is the Sea Search Project Coordinator for South and West Wales. So um, hope you're ready for Kate's um, presentation, the stories of the sea, as she shares with us her wealth of experience. Thank you very much, Kate. Not quite that. Um, good evening. Can everyone, I hope you can all see my screen okay. Um, I'm assuming I'll be told if, if I can't be. Okay, so yes, I'm Kate Locke and um, I work at the SCOMA Marine Conservation Zone down in Pembrokeshire. And tonight my talk's The Grey Seals, Wonders of the Irish Sea. So here we have a beautiful cow coming out here on the beach. The Latin name for the grey seals is Halicurus gripus. And this is a Greek name and it means sea pig with hooked nose. The Welsh name is Morlo. And this hooked nose we'll see more prominently in the bull seals, which I'll be showing you a little later on. So a few grey seal facts. There's an estimated around 150,000 grey seals here in the UK. Now this is 50% of the world's population. So the grey seals in the UK are particularly important on the, on the whole world um, sort of um, scheme of things. Um, the majority are found up in Scotland um, and on the east side of uh, the east coast of England as well. Um, but we get an estimated around 4,700 grey seals here in Wales out of which we get about 2,000 pups born each year. So as you can see, this is only a small percentage of the UK population, but um, as we, we go through the talk, we'll see that um, they, they are found all around the Welsh coast. So the cows, which is the females, they live for around 35 years, and bulls, the males, uh, for around 25 years. So they're, they're quite long-lived animals. In the autumn time, the, the cows will come back to the shores to give birth to their pups. So autumn time, this is being, this is actually from mid-August now right through to November. So it's quite a large, um, it's over two or three months that the cows will be coming back to shore. Most of the time they'll be spending out at sea. So this is when she gives birth to her pup, as we can see here on the right, and she'll be coming ashore regularly to feed it. So around five to anything between five to eight times a day, she'll come and feed a really super rich um, milk, which is almost like clotted cream and uh, allows her, her pup here to start gaining weight. So at SCOMA, we conduct a very intensive uh, grey seal pupping survey each year. And we do this by tracking each and every single seal that's born in the reserve um, through a classification system. So we can track how it's growing and how it's doing. So our class one pup here, that's the first class, that's a newborn pup. And as you can see here, when they're first born, they have this baggy white fur, and it's almost like it's too big for them. They also have very little head mobility, it's very floppy still, and they can't move around very easily. But with the fantastic milk that is being fed, it very quickly gains weight. And within five days, it's already starting to get head mobility, starting to get a lot more mobility, so it's moving around the beach a lot, and it's quite vocal at this stage as well. Very quickly though, at 10 days, so literally just 10 days old, it's starting to really fill out. And it's now lost its neck definition and starting to form these small sort of torpedo shaped animals. And this is the perfect shape for living in the sea. And a few days later, it will start molting this lovely fur. This will come out in huge handfuls and start molting very quickly. And at only three weeks old, it will have already now developed its beautiful new pelage. This is its first new fur that's waterproof, it's super tight, it's going to be warm, it's got lots of fat reserves, and it's now ready to help it heading out to sea, which is pretty handy, really, because this is the stage that the cow now basically abandons her pup. The pup now has to fend for itself and um, learn to feed and thrive out in the sea itself. So what happens next? Oh, sorry. Um, so how are the seal pups doing? How is the population doing in Wales in general? 
From our SCOMA surveys, they've been conducted since the 70s. However, since 1992, the effort we've been putting into the survey and the methodologies have been consistent and the same. So we've got comparable data and we can look at the long term trends of what's going on with the population. So from 92 right through to about 2008, we have a very steady population around the Scoma Island area um, of around 220 pups born each year. But since 2008, we've had a steady increase, as you can see here. And in 2000, uh, 2020, last autumn, we had 420 pups born. So this is showing that we're having a very slowly a growing population. And similar patterns are being seen around Ramsey Island, um, North Pembrokeshire coast, um, South Pembrokeshire, around the Castle Martin areas, and also up in North Wales. So steadily, we've been having an increase in population and um, it's, it's pretty healthy. And as one of the key features of quite a few of the uh, marine SACs in Wales, um, this is quite important because it's showing that it's currently in favourable condition, which is really good news. So once the cow's finished um, with her pup, um, strangely, she comes straight into season, as in the breeding season. And here we have a bull seal. Now you can see the hook's nose um, from its namesake. So it's large hooked nose and this real thick neck as well. Very, very broad set. And as you can see, much larger than the cows. So a few more seal facts here. Both the cows and the bulls become sexually mature at around four to five years old. But a successful mating bull are, unlike, are more likely to be around 11 to 16 years. So for quite a few years, they aren't actually in a mating state. And that's because the bulls need to compete um, to be able to um, mate with the females. And they compete using threatening gestures to be able to dominate a mating site. Now, a mating site is the same site as where the pups have been born. So the, the pupping sites on those beaches, the cows will be congregated there, having birth, giving birth to their pups. In the meantime, the male takes no part in the pup development or looking after the pups. What he's doing is um, basically at the mouth of the bays and he'll be um, patrolling up and down, competing against other males so that then he can become the dominant male and can mate with all the cows on that beach as they come into season. Once the mating has happened, the egg is then fertilized, but they have a cunning trick here. They can delay the implantation of the egg into the womb for around three months. And they need to do this because otherwise they're gonna spend the whole year, every year pregnant. So the cows have a chance here to rest up during the winter months, recover, from the huge weight loss that she'd have had giving birth and feeding her pup. And um, it means then in springtime, the egg will then start development and there's a nine month gestation period. So here we have the seals hauled up in the winter. So from late autumn, right through winter, um, many seals will be hauling out on what we call haul out sites. Some of these are similar sites just where pups have been born as well, um, especially on some of the more remote islands. They also like secluded bays around the um, mainland too. It's not often you can see this um, from, um, from the shores um, looking down because they, they really do like to have secluded locations. It's at this state that they go into what's a kind of slight hibernation, uh, not a true hibernation because they can lower their metabolism, they can um, reduce their heart rates right down and they will molt off much of their outer fur and start allowing a new fresh fur to grow through. If the storms and weather comes in, they do move site occasionally, so they're not um, fully asleep, but they, they try and rest up as much as they can during this time. And then early in the season, so from February really, February, March onwards, they'll start heading out to sea. And um, really this is the stage when we, we know less about them and we need to start using things like satellite tags and stuff to be able to track them and gain information. So seals actually spend around 80% of their time underwater and they can breath hold up to 20 minutes at a time. They can dive up to about 100 meters depth, which is really incredibly deep. Um, I mean, I just find that absolutely phenomenal. They use these incredibly long whiskers to pick up the vibration trails of their prey 
and they can even sleep in the water. OK, it needs to be at the surface, but they can pop their noses out of the surface of the water and they literally, in a vertical position, pop up and down, and we call this bottle nosing. They also use remote islands and remote rocks um, where they can also haul out and rest as well. So here we have a satellite tag fixed to the back of a seal. And this tracking device is what's allowed us to know where many of the seals will be going, how deep they can go, um, and, and track what's happening during a season. And these are pretty expensive, and they've been um, attached by um, a group of scientists from the Sea Mammal Research Unit. Um, and the results are really quite staggering. So here we've got four, just 14 satellite tagged adult seals. Um, these were tagged off um, uh, Ramsey Island, off Skomer Island, and also from a site up here in North Wales. And um, looking at the tracks here, you can see now why they really are the wonders of the Irish Sea. So these satellite tracks here, we have the green one, that's obviously moved around. It's been um, tagged here in North Wales, but it's moved up to the um, southern coast up here in Scotland, around the Isle of Man too, and others are now moving across to Ireland. We've got ones that go all over, so here in Cardigan Bay, down to France as well, and uh, out here to the Gower often as well, but they really do move around a lot, and they're very much individuals. Seals do not hang out together. The only time they congregate is when they come to shore for the breeding season. The rest of the time, they're very much individuals. Some like to travel a long distance, others like staying closer home. But as you can see, imagine now, if we have over 4,000 seals here in Wales, what the tracking will be like. And you know that you're never actually, if you're out at sea, you're probably never particularly far from a gray seal somewhere wandering about. And when we look again at the, the marine special areas conservation, you can see against here that each of our marine conservation areas we've got. So the Penfleena Sarnau and Cardigan Bay here and Pembrokeshire as well, and even into Carmarthen Bay here as well. Seals can be found at all these sites. Three of these sites is actually a feature of the SAC. So the fact that they're currently in, in good condition um, means that um, uh, that um, these, these SACs can, um, you know, doing a good job for them at the moment. A few more satellite tags. These are the ones which were fixed on that actually had the depth information as well. And this is just from, um, I think there's five here, five satellite tags. You can see just from five seals alone, quite the distances they've been tracking. Um, I like to be able to compare this because one here was tracked, um, fixed down in, uh, in Ramsey, and it's traveled right up here to the Fleen and then on to Anglesey. So it's really moved around. So they have congregated back here for the breeding and for the pupping, but then they'll be moving around all over. And the red one here has also traveled huge distances. But if you look at the pink one there, this one stayed closer to home. And this really varies so much. They're very much individuals. So what are the threats and the issues for seals? The weather's a big one. Out at sea, they're absolutely fine. That's where they thrive. That's where they, they um, you know, excel and what they've been designed to do. They love being out at sea. But if they are close to the coast, when large storms happen, that's when they're really at risk. So here, as an example, we've got Storm Ophelia. This was on the 16th of October in 2017. And this was right in the middle of the breeding season. Oh, sorry, in the pupping season. So pupping. The peak time is actually in September. So the pups, as we can see, because they only, um, they basically leave the shores at three weeks old. Pups that would have been born in um, August and into September, throughout September, would have already left and left the shores. So those ones weren't at threat. It's only the seal pups that actually were at the shore at the time that would have been at threat. So wave heights were recorded over 16 meters and we had wind speeds gusting to 110 mile an hour. And yes, the next day it was carnage. So pups that were being born and were actually currently on the beaches themselves at the time or close by had little chance to survive. But when we look at survival and look at our trends, so going back now to the SCOMA long-term data set, we can see what our percentage survival is over the years. And 
generally it's around 80%. That's the kind of norm that we have um, throughout, the, throughout all the years. But here you can see there was a little dip here in 2017 after scormophilia, but it, we still had a survival of around 70%. Now, what we'd be concerned is if year after year we had these huge, big storms um, knocking out the seal pups at that particular time of the year. But if other years it's not so bad, so the subsequent three years here, we can see there is actually a good survival at around 80%. So it's these dips can be, um, the, the, the population overall is quite robust and it can survive and um, pull back up again. Other threats, commercial fishing. Nia mentioned this too. Any netting that's been discarded or has um, basically um, got lost at sea is always a threat to any marine mammal um, or seabirds and um, creatures out at sea. And we do record around 20 to 30 um, seals each year which have evidence of netting um, or scars where netting has been around the necks. And rubbish is an issue too. Rubbish. Here we've got some large polystyrene blocks and lots of litter around, which might not directly impact this pup, but this polystyrene and other plastics, they break down into smaller and smaller particles and microplastics are a big issue, especially with seal diets. Seal diet studies have been completed by students and here we've got some feces that's been collected and now has been sieved and sorted. And the aim of this is to try and look for these. These are small bones called the utoliths, and they're the um, bones that are found in the ears of fish. And each fish species will have a unique shape that can be identified, and therefore we know what the, the seal's been eating, which kind of fish species it's been eating. But more alarmingly is the fact that whilst doing this study, we were finding as well small pieces of um, polythene here, and also these microplastics. And as Nia mentioned in her talk, a lot of this is through bioaccumulation, so it could well be that the fish has actually eaten the microplastics and then when the seal eats it, it will then go right directly into the seal itself. So slowly more and more plastics will accumulate as the seal is eating more and more fish. Pollution. This, as Neo mentioned, comes in many forms. And here we've got some seals which have got oiling. Um, and this is not just from large oil spills. This can also be from discharges from smaller boats as well, um, and oil that's just gone into sea. And what's more of an issue here is, is not just the pelage, it's the fact that as the pup is feeding, it can take in toxins as well, um, as the, the milk's going to be in, impacted as well. Fortunately, we do have fantastic services to help rescue seals. Um, the British Divers Marine Life Rescue is very active as is the RSPCA. And so seals, whether they've been um, impacted by things like oil or other types of pollutions, um, or pups have been um, threatened through weather and have lost weight and have been abandoned in some sort of way, they're, they're often taken to the seal hospitals where fantastic services um, can um, help them gain weight and um, get to a healthy state again, where they can then be released back to sea. So disturbance as well. This is another issue, especially from boat users. So where we have some remote rocks occasionally, where seals often like to haul out, if boat users are there. So perhaps there weren't any seal, um, seals there at the time, but it does mean now these sites can now not be used by the seals um, um, themselves to actually haul out and rest. So we have though fantastic marine codes. So here we've got the example of the Keradigian marine code and Pembrokeshire Marine Code, which is now also available as an app. So these facilities and these codes are there for you to be able to use, and it helps you really enjoy the, um, the wildlife you're seeing, but being able to do it with care and due diligence. So seals are protected by legislation, and we do have, um, we, we do have a responsibility to try and minimise our disturbance, and we can do this using these codes of conducts. And now as well, there's a fantastic new website that's been developed by all the um, marine bodies in Wales called the Wild Seas Wales. And this, this website now is there to allow us to discover and to enjoy our wildlife, but also to respect it. 
And this is very important. It's having a balance, being able to go out there and enjoy and look at our wildlife, but to do it responsibly. And there's some fantastic small videos as part of this website, which you can watch, very simple videos. Um, and they very clearly sort of outline the best ways to be able to go out and explore, go and enjoy yourself, but also to respect the wildlife out there. So the other way people like to go and see seals is often during the pupping season. Um, this is, as we say, the time that the seals are back at sea. Um, but again, we need to do this responsibly. And so we have signs out um, to be able to help and support people so they can see how they can do this with care. Um, here, um, this is at my local, well, one of my local sites, Martins Haven. Um, and the problem is often we put these signs up on our notice boards, but people don't actually look at the signs um, because as they're coming down the, um, the lane to go and look at the beach and we've got a seal pup down here, they miss the signs because they're too excited. So we kind of put out signs as well at this point when we've got seal pups on the beach. So it's in a prominent place and people, as they're walking down the lane, they can actually see it. And this means then people know instantly that they need to stop at the top of the beach and they can watch with care. Um, and people also put their, their dogs on leads and can watch from a distance. And we have some really good um, information available too. So if you're wanting to go out and watch seals, then do pick up a leaflet or um, you can download these from the internet as well. So um, these seal watching leaflets, they're, they're helpful because they provide you lots of fun facts lots of information, where to go, what you can do to help, um, and how you can do it safely and um, learn about what you're looking at. So currently, um, the, the different MPA officers, the Marine Protective Area officers around Wales, are now creating an all Wales leaflet um, that should be available soon. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, Dioch, and um, back to Dr. Alec. Thank you very much there, Kate. Very informative, thank you.